Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Early Tick-Borne Disease Diagnosis with Molecular Testing, Knowing What's at Stake. I am Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labyrinth and brought to you by Diasporan Molecular. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.molecular.diasporan.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Neil Anderson. Neil is the Assistant Medical Director at the Barnes Jewish Clinical Microbiology Laboratory. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Neil, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, my name is Neil Anderson, and today I'll be talking about early tick-borne disease diagnosis with molecular testing and knowing what's at stake. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit of our journey through tick-borne testing here in the St. Louis, Missouri area. Uh, here are my disclosures. And here are the objectives for today's talk. So by the end of today's talk, viewers should be able to list the common tick-borne diseases in the South Central United States, identify the common clinical features of ehrlichiosis caused by Ehrlichia shafiensis and related species, describe the reasons for simultaneously testing for multiple tick-borne pathogens, understand the pros and cons of different laboratory developed diagnostic techniques for ehrlichiosis, including testing using the diasoran liaison, which I'll explain in detail later, and list the characteristics of an ideal tick-borne disease diagnostic. So just a little background about where we perform testing. Uh, I am one of the medical directors at Barnes Jewish Molecular Infectious Disease Laboratory. Uh, this laboratory serves a multiple, multiple hospitals and clinics in the Barnes Jewish Christian Network. And this spreads out over the St. Louis area. Um, it, this includes Barnes Jewish Hospital, which is a 1,300 bed academic adult hospital, St. Louis Children's Hospital, six community hospitals, and multiple community outpatient clinics. So we're seeing a wide variety of patients. For those of you who may not have been to St. Louis uh, recently or ever, um, here's a, a picture just reminding us of where St. Louis is in the United States. Um, we're known for having a pretty big arch, a uh, pretty decent baseball team, some uh, uh, pretty famous horses, but we're also known for our ticks. Uh, we have a lot of ticks in our area, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Now, when we talk about tick-borne diseases, I think one of the first things that comes to people's mind is uh, Lyme disease. Uh, so this is an image from the CDC that looks at the reported cases of Lyme disease uh, during 2017. Now, what you'll notice is that Lyme disease really is not a problem in our area anyway in St. Louis. Uh, we have very, very few cases, and most, most of these are the results of travel to a Lyme, Lyme endemic area. Similarly, other diseases carried by Ixodes scapularis are really not common in St. Louis. So these aren't the diseases we're worried about. What we're worried about are diseases carried by this tick, the Lone Star Tick, or Amblyoma americanum. And in fact, St. Louis is considered one of the epicenters of Amblyoma americanum distribution. Uh, that puts us at risk for a very different variety of tick-borne diseases. And I'm going to expand on that a little later here. 
Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the biology of Amblyoma americanum. So what I'm showing you here is the life cycle is the just very typical life cycle of a tick. Um, and uh, this would apply to Dermacenter, Exodes scapularis, different ticks. Um, essentially, what happens is eggs are laid, and they hatch into six-legged larvae. These larvae typically feast on a small mammal. They develop into nymphs, which, which feed on a larger mammal, which develop into adults, which feed on the largest mammal in the life cycle. Now, these mammals, depending on the tick, are, are usually pretty well-defined. Um, here, are a, here are some images of the different life cycle stages of the Amblyoma americanum tick. Now, what's unique about Amblyoma americanum is that compared to other ticks, it's quite aggressive. The host range is therefore pretty nonspecific. Remember how I said we proceed, the different ticks proceed through the different hosts in a pretty regular fashion. However, Amblyoma americanum larvae can be found on squirrels, raccoons, possums, turkeys, even some large mammals such as deer. The adults and nymphs are also not very picky regarding the type of animal they feed on. The adults and nymphs, the adults, nymphs and larvae are also more readily trapped from the field and forest habitats compared to other ticks. So what you see in this image is someone doing what we refer to as dragging for ticks. So you typically drag a white sheet, and the ticks are attracted to the sheet, and this is how we capture ticks for study. Now, it just so happens that Amblyoma americanum are more likely to be captured because they more actively hunt out their host. So they're likely overrepresented in sample studies. So what, what you can take this all as meaning is that Amblyoma americanum is uniquely aggressive. So if we compare the major tick-borne diseases carried by Exodes and Amblyoma, as I said before, they are quite different. With Exodes, we're worried primarily about babesiosis, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and Powassan virus. Amblyoma, on the other hand, carries ehrlichiosis, tularemia, stari, and alpha-gal allergy. I'm going to expand on these a little more starting with tularemia. So tularemia is actually caused by Francisella tularensis. You can see the different cases of tularemia that have been reported uh, uh, through the CDC in the, um, in, within the United States. During 2016, there was a total of 36 cases in Missouri, and this is more than any other state. You'll see that this disease occurs even outside the range of amblyoma, um, it's important to know that Francisella is not just transmitted by the amblyoma tick, but there's other ways of getting this. However, amblyoma transmission is a major mechanism, at least in the Missouri area. Patients with Francisella, uh, uh, they, they uh, present with fever and a variety of other symptoms. And these symptoms give Francisella it's different names based on how the patient is presenting. So you can have ulcer, ulceral glandular francisella, glandular, ocular glandular, oral pharyngeal, pneumonic, or typhoidal. Here's an example of an ulcer caused by francisella. So how do we make a diagnosis of this disease? Well, it's readily grown in the microbiology laboratory. Um, here is a picture of a plate with francisella on it. And it, we can presumptively identify it using basic biochemicals. However, this organism is highly infectious to laboratory staff. So it's still very important that we know we have a possibility of growing francisella before we work with different plates in the microbiology lab. That's really all I'm going to talk about uh, for francisella. Um, I, I do want to mention uh, STARI, though. So STARI is Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. It's actually an acronym. It's an erythema migrans-like rash at the site of a tick bite. So here are some examples of starry rashes. Uh, these patients often have accompanying fever, and the cause for this has yet to be established, though it's secondary to the bite of the amblyoma tick. As far as diagnosis goes, this is diagnosed clinically. You need proper symptoms, geography, and history of tick bites. And this typically resolves without treatment. So the big challenge with STARI 
is to not confuse it with erythema migrans, which may be a result from Lyme disease. And then finally, I want to make sure we talk just a little bit about alpha-gal allergy, mainly because this is a fascinating new disease that we're finding is caused by ticks um, that, that uh, really we're just starting to learn about. Um, these are allergic symptoms triggered by exposure to red meat. So it may seem kind of uh, strange that this is associated with the bite of a tick, but what is actually occurring is the patients are reacting to galactose alpha-1,3 galactose. This is a protein found in the cell wall of non-primate mammals, and patients become exposed to this protein through the bite of a lone star tick. It's been shown that this can actually been, be caused by other ticks as well, uh, though we do know the lone star tick is uh, likely a major cause of this disease. This leads to a hypersensitivity reaction and an allergy to red meat. The affected patients develop wheezing, hives, and rash following red meat exposure. The true incidence is unknown, though most prevalent, though this disease is most prevalent in the distribution of the lone star tick. And this is diagnosed through traditional skin prick allergy testing. Now I want to talk about ehrlichiosis, and that's what we're going to focus on for the majority of the day. Um, ehrlichiosis is uh, caused by different species of the genus Ehrlichia, and that includes Ehrlichia schaffiensis, a wingy eye, or Miris oclarensis, the newly described Miris oclarensis. Ehrlichia schaffiensis is the most common of these uh, to be associated with human disease. This is named, these all are named after Paul Ehrlich, who is depicted here. This is a German microbiologist who, among many other things, developed new staining techniques and a cure for syphilis, though his claim to fame was Ehrlichia. This is an obligate intracellular bacteria related to the rickettsia, and it's an intracellular bacteria within monocytes. So Ehrlichia schaffiensis preferentially infects monocytes. The other name for this is human monocytic ehrlichiosis. The other species of Ehrlichia are very important veterinary pathogens. So here's a little information regarding the epidemiology of Ehrlichia. First, cases of human monocytic ehrlichiosis were described all the way back in 1986. Infection rates have steadily increased since then, as you can see here based on this data from the CDC. As you can see, when we were monitoring this using passive surveillance techniques, we had an estimated 0.7 cases per million population. However, with more active surveillance techniques, such as mandatory reporting in some states, we're seeing about 100 to 200 cases per 100,000 population. And the detection rates continue to rise. And if you look at the annual distribution of Ehrlichia, uh, based on this 2017 data, you'll see that four states account for approximately greater than 50% of all cases. This includes Missouri, Kansas, Virginia, and New York. So Ehrlichia is a big problem in these states. Peak incidence occurs during June and July months, and this isn't surprising because that coincides in the peak feeding of amblyoma species. Here is a look at the incidence of Ehrlichia infections here at our hospital, Barnes Jewish Hospital. As you can see, we have, uh, we have seasonal peaks that occur primarily in June and July months. And these peaks are very well defined. And in fact, during those peaks, we can see approximately five cases per week. So it, it most def we definitely see a lot of cases during these summer months. What are the symptoms of Ehrlichia? Well, symptomatology typically takes one to two weeks to develop following a tick bite. Early symptoms are quite nonspecific. These include fever, headache, malaise, rash, nausea, and confusion, and for all intensive purposes, look like a flu-like illness. However, late illness is more severe. Ehrlichia can cause meningencephalitis, end organ failure, respiratory distress, and patients can even die from Ehrlichia infection. They may also have bleeding complications due to thrombocytopenia, which is also a typical part of the disease. Typically, though, 
in most healthy adults, disease is overall quite mild. However, the immunosuppressed and extreme of age uh, tend to have these more severe sequelae. And what are some of the outcomes of Ehrlichia infection? Exactly how severe is an Ehrlichia infection? So this was best detailed in a recent CDC review from Heitman and colleagues. What they did is they looked at all cases from 2008 to 2012. This was about 4,600 cases that were reported in the US. And what they found is that a lot of these patients were quite sick. Approximately 57% of those patients required hospitalization. About 14% were immunosuppressed. And a whopping 11% had life-threatening complications. This included renal failure, meningitis, ARDS, DIC, pneumonia, and sepsis. And like I said, Ehrlichia shaftiensis can kill patients. The overall case fatality rate in this report was about 1%, which is actually quite high. It's much higher in extremes of age. So as you can see here, the, it, it, it most certainly is quite high in patients that are above 70 years of age. However, we have a very high peak in patients less than five years of age. And this is a fatality rate of nearly 4%. So that is quite high considering all the other diseases that might manifest in children of that age. The authors hypothesize why this might be so high. A lot of, office, a, a lot of uh, uh, people think actually that physicians may be unwilling to treat children empirically with doxycycline given the side effects of teeth staining um, if they aren't sure that the offending organism is Ehrlichia. So this kind of points towards the need for a rapid and accurate diagnostic test. So I just want to touch briefly on some of the other species of Ehrlichia and their importance. So starting with Ehrlichia or wingii, this was recognized in 1999 as another causative agent of human Ehrlichiosis. Prior to its discovery, it was thought to be exclusively a canine pathogen. Um, it has the same vector as Ehrlichia shafiensis and Leoma americanum, and it, however, it infects granulocytes rather than monocytes like Ehrlichia shafiensis. Human infections are also more rare than Ehrlichia shafiensis. In fact, there's only been 55 cases that were reported in that 2008 to 2012 CDC report and those are mostly in immunocompromised patients. And those patients had milder disease. There were no reported deaths secondary to Ehrlichia wingii. So if we look at the comparison between, the, between Ehrlichia shafiensis and Ehrlichia wingii incidence, what we find is that the incidence of Ehrlichia shafiensis is far more higher. However, the incidence of Ehrlichia wingii is certainly on the rise. So as of 2017, we have 185 cases, and you can see a steady incline in cases from 2008 to 2012. And many believe this incidence is significantly underestimated given the relatively milder disease, so we're probably not testing for a wingy eye as often, but also many believe that a lot of cases of Ehrlichia or wingy eye are mistakenly reported as Ehrlichia shafiensis. So much more needs to be learned about Ehrlichia wingii. There are other species that can cause Ehrlichiosis. Um, one that I mentioned was Ehrlichia miris oclarensis. This is a newly described species. Um, there have been isolated cases in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The vector for this is different. It's Ixodes scapularis. And since its discovery in 2009, 115 cases have been described. This too causes a very mild disease with no reported deaths, and its presence may explain some of these isolated cases of Ehrlichiosis that are outside of the Amblyoma americanum range. So these might actually have been Ehrlichia miris oclarensis. So now getting to the diagnosis of Ehrlichiosis. So this really should be suspected by physicians when they have this, trip, this typical triad of basic laboratory findings. Patients with Ehrlichia often have thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and elevated liver enzymes. The organism itself can be directly visualized on a blood smear. So what you're seeing here 
this cell with the dark blue cytoplasm is a monocyte. And you can see the large purple nucleus of the monocyte, and next to it, a smaller purple morule, which is a collection of the Ehrlichia schaffiensis organism. This is typically hard to find, though, in a peripheral smear, since monocytes are only a small proportion of the circulating white blood cells. Techniques can be used, such as buffy coat examination, to, uh, to be able to have better sensitivity when actually looking for the organism. So the way this works is you spin a blood tube, you pull off the buffy coat, which is uh, enriched for white blood cells, and then you have a greater likelihood of finding the organism. However, this is not routinely done. The best diagnostic test for ehrlichiosis is our molecular techniques. There's, unfortunately, FDA-approved PCR assays are not currently available. Most of these assays that are in use are real-time PCR lab-developed. Um, many have, or several have been described, uh, though there's only a handful of these actually available for routine clinical testing. As such, testing is typically sent to state or commercial reference laboratories. This can be problematic since disease can be fatal unless treated properly, promptly. So how do we diagnose ehrlichiosis here at our hospital? Um, previously, we were performing testing using an in-house laboratory assay performed on the Light Cycler 2.0. However, in February 2018, we had to discontinue this testing. This was for a couple of reasons. One was we were transitioning lab space. So we were moving from our St. Louis Children's Hospital Virology Lab into our Molecular Infectious Disease Laboratory, which me meant we had to reevaluate our entire test menu. At that time, the manufacturer made the decision to no longer support the Light Cycler 2.0. So a choice was made to switch platforms. Therefore, we made the decision to send testing to a reference laboratory while examining new options. So this is just a little bit about the overall PCR capabilities at our laboratory. Um, the majority of our testing is laboratory developed and is the majority of our virology testing is laboratory developed and is performed using the Diasoran liaison test. The way this works is you have a patient specimen. It is extracted on an automated extractor the extract and reagents are loaded onto this universal disk, and the disk is loaded onto the integrated cycler for real-time PCR. The real-time PCR for some of these assays anyway is performed using TACMAN probes, which are seen here, and the instrument allows for simultaneously thermocycling and measurement of fluorescence. So Diasorin has multiple ASRs that are available, and we use a fair amount of them. Uh, we're doing testing for CMV, HSV, ADNO, PAR echovirus, HHV6, BZV, PARVO, and Bordetella pertussis. Now, since we're using this instrument for so many different applications, it was very attractive in, when we saw in July 2018 Diasorin released ASRs for the detection of Ehrlichia. So we decided to evaluate these ASRs. Now, one of our early questions was, is Ehrlichia detection enough? Um, it is by far the most common and concerning pathogen in Missouri, uh, I, and that's based on the data I've already shown you. However, St. Louis is only a few hours from what we refer to as Exodes country. Um, and in fact, one could argue that we all are already in Exodes country. This, coupled with the fact that many patients don't even remember a tick bite and essentially no one actually brings in a tick for ID, means we need to plan in our laboratory for both amblyoma and ixodes exposure. So based on that, we can kind of go back to the different diseases caused by these different ticks and consider what we should include in an ideal assay. So Lyme disease is going to be diagnosed serologically, so we're not worried about that in the molecular assay. Tularemia is readily cultured. Stari is diagnosed clinically. Alpha-gal allergy is diagnosed through allergy testing. Powassan virus is interesting. It does need PCR for detection, but at this time the distribution and overall significance is unknown, and we don't typically see a lot of this in our area. But Babesiosis uh, is interesting as well. So PCR definitely helps with the diagnosis of babesiosis, 
However, um, most cases of Babesia will present uh, and, and be visible in the CBC since this is an intracellular parasite of erythrocytes. So at least for our hospital, we feel confident that we'd catch a case of babesiosis on a CBC. However, as I described, ehrlichiosis, you're not going to catch on the CBC, uh, so you need PCR. And the same goes for anaplasmosis. Um, anaplasmosis is best diagnosed using PCR, and I'll explain why. Um, anaplasmosis is the cause, or excuse me, anaplasma phagocytophilum is the causative agent of anaplasmosis. This formally was considered in Ehrlichia, and it was formally called human granulocytic Ehrlichiosis. It's a close relative of Ehrlichia. The disease spectrum is also very similar to Ehrlichiosis. Patients often have nonspecific fever, headache, and malaise, and can have severe disease, particularly if they're a part of an at-risk population. Um, patients also develop the typical lab findings of leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and elevated liver function enzymes. The diagnosis of anaplasmosis can be made on the peripheral blood smear. You, you can see morulae, similar to what we saw for Ehrlichia, within granulocytes. Though, in order to do this with adequate sensitivity, you need to examine a buff, buffy coat. Therefore, diagnosis is best accomplished using PCR. So, based on that, um, we, this is what we, so, so we knew that we wanted a assay to diagnose both Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. Currently, Diasaur Molecular has primers available to cover three tick-borne diseases. This includes Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and Babesia. So this allows for tailing of testing according to our local epidemiology. I kind of walked you through our rationale, but we decided to multiplex for both Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. So I'll walk you through our assay design and evaluation. Um, the way we designed our assay is we plan to have whole blood specimens extracted on the Chiagen Easy one These would then be tested using multiplex primer probe sets for Ehrlichia and Anaplasma and run on the liaison MDX. The way we evaluated this is we used a bank of frozen whole blood samples submitted for Ehrlichia and Anaplasma testing from over the past 10 years. We were quite lucky to have this bank on hand. We tested a total of 123 previously tested specimens. This included 76 positive specimens, positive for a range of different Ehrlichia, Schaffiensis, Awingii, and Canis, and 22 Anaplasma phagocytophilum positive specimens. This also included 47 specimens submitted for routine testing but found to be negative for Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. So this is, these are example results from the assay. Um, on the left, you have an Anaplasma positive. So what you're seeing is a green AMP curve that correlates to the Anaplasma positivity and a purple internal control curve. Uh, the Ehrlichia assay, or on the right is a Ehrlichia positive specimen. So we have the red AMP curve correlating to Ehrlichia, and we have our internal control. So what assay did we compare to? So these were all previously tested using the Roche Light Cycler 2.0 um, and a previously published laboratory developed assay. The publication is at the bottom of the slide here if anyone cares to read more about this assay. It is frequently used by several different uh, reference laboratories. Um, this real-time PCR assay utilizes uh, a single pair of FRET probes. It's capable of detecting and differentiating through melt curve analysis, anaplasma, Ehrlichia shafiensis, Ehrlichia wingii, and Ehrlichia oclarensis. So how did our assay stack up to the comparator? So what you're seeing here is our accuracy data for Ehrlichia. Um, as you can see, uh, we had a uh, fairly high positive percent agreement, negative percent agreement, and overall percent agreement, all greater than 90%. What I'll point out is that we had one extra case detected from a patient with tick exposure and Ehrlichia-like symptoms. So this may be a new detection with this new assay. We'll also point out are these five potential false negatives. So there were five 
specimens that were positive on the initial comparator assay but negative on our new assay. Um, this was five out of 54. So if we break that down and look at the different species, what we found is that um, it was actually the it was actually four out of the 25 Ehrlichia wingii that we failed to pick up with the new assay. However, two of the previous Ehrlichia wingii positives that were negative on the new assay actually did have crossing points greater than 40 CT. So what we did based on this is we looked at our cutoff and we examined this using 45 as a cutoff for positivity. When we used 45 as a cutoff for positivity, what we found is that we only had one out of 20 case, 27 cases of Chaffiensis that were missed, and two out of 25 cases of a wingii that were missed, and no cases of canis. Now, you may argue you don't want to miss any cases. Um, however, I'll point out that some of these specimens were greater than five to 10 years old. So a lot of these specimens uh, uh, potentially degraded over time, and unfortunately, we were unable to test uh, using the comparator method in real time to see if they still would have been detected by the comparator method. So overall, I think this data looks pretty good. And if you look at our anaplasma phagocytophilum accuracy, um, that data looks pretty good as well. Uh, we had uh, a very high positive, negative, and overall percent agreements, all higher than 95%. Another thing that we did is we looked at precision and limit of detection for both Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. Now, I understand this is a very busy chart, uh, but what we did is on the, on the uh, left-hand column here, what you can see is we prepared different concentrations and we ran them in duplicate on three different days. And that's what you see on the top, the different days of testing. And so all in all, each concentration got ran six times. We defined the limit of detection as the last concentration at which we got six out of six detection. So if you look at this data, we were able to detect Ehrlichia six out of six all the way down to a concentration of 500 copies per mil. So our estimated limit of detection was 500 copies per mil. Similarly, for anaplasma, we did the same thing and we were able to detect for anaplasma all the way down to 250 copies per mil. So what do these limits of detection actually mean? Well, if you compare these limits of detection to the limit of detection that's been published uh, for our comparator assay, um, they're actually much lower, um, at least tenfold lower. So we know that this assay is adequately sensitive for patient testing at least it has the analytical sensitivity needed for patient testing. Another thing we looked at was inhibition of the assay by different things commonly encountered in patient specimens. Specifically, we looked at lipemia and bilirubin. And what you'll see here is given increase in concentrations of lipemia and bilirubin, we still maintained a qualitatively positive result. However, we did see some drift in the CT reported by the assay so there is some inhibition observed with lipemic and icteric samples, though it's certainly not enough to preclude clinical testing. So just to summarize our validation data, um, the laboratory-developed assay that we had put together was deemed to have acceptable accuracy for detection of both Ehrlichia and anaplasma. The limit of detection rivals that of currently in use laboratory developed tests for both Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, and neither assay is significantly affected by physiological levels of lipemia or icterus. So that being said, because we did see some drift in the CTs, we report results with a disclaimer that false negatives may be seen with highly lipemic or icteric samples just to be safe. So based on this, our validation was completed and we were able to put in place routine testing, which we initiated in November 2018. Now, is this a success? Now, I, you know, I will say putting an Ehrlichia assay into play in the month of November is not exactly something you're going to get kudos for. Um, you know, it, summer's over, and so we're not seeing a lot of Ehrlichia, and uh, it, it's not really the best time, or at least the most useful time to go live with an assay. So. Uh, we were feeling a little down on ourselves until we had this case on Christmas Day. 
So I want to walk you through this case and kind of tell you this story, and uh, I, I think it really highlights why this assay is important. Um, this was a 17-year-old male admitted with fever and altered mental status. This guy was found to be hypotensive on arrival to the hospital with concerns for sepsis, so he was quite sick. Two weeks prior, the patient had developed a rash on his right forearm. He was initially treated with Bactrim with only mild improvement. However, around day 10 of treatment, he developed fever, nausea, and vomiting. These symptoms worsened for four days prior to presentation. When he arrived, he was very sick. He was initially stabilized with fluid and pressors and started on broad-spectrum antibiotics. Numerous tests were sent to diagnose a, at this time, just simply suspected infectious etiology. Blood cultures were negative, EBV serology was negative, CMV serology, respir respiratory multiplex, hepatitis serology, and HIV serology, all negative. However, he did have some concerning laboratory findings. So his white count was quite low. Hemoglobin and hematocrit were okay. Platelets were also very low. So he's leukopenic and thrombocytopenic. On abdominal imaging, he had splenomegaly, and interestingly, he had a very high ferritin. His ferritin was, a, was above 5,700, and this is very high when you consider the normal ferritin is around 400. So based on these laboratory findings and clinical presentation, the physician suspected a specific diagnosis. Now, it's not the diagnosis you're thinking. It's not what we've been talking about. And keep in mind, this is winter. So at this point, Ehrlichia really wasn't on their radar. At this point, the, di the diagnosis that was being suspected is what I have depicted here in, of, in the bone marrow of a unrelated patient. So this is what our patient might have looked, or this is what the bone marrow from our patient might have looked like had a biopsy been performed. What you're seeing here is something quite bizarre. There's white blood cells that are phagocytosing, red blood cell precursors, and other white blood cells. So this is highly, highly abnormal. And these are findings consistent with what we call hemophagocytosis. So what was suspected that this patient had is something called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or as we call it, HLH. This is a rare but potentially fatal syndrome caused by an uncontrolled and ineffective activation of monocytes leading to a hyperinflammatory state. It can be primary or secondary. So the primary causes for this are usually some sort of genetic defect in a natural killer cell protein, but it can secondarily be triggered by a viral or bacterial infection. For diagnosis of this illness, there's a, there's a set of criteria that must be met. And you must meet five of these eight criteria. So some of these criteria are easy to measure, such as fever, fever, splenomegaly, or bicytopenia. Some are more hard because they require specific testing, such as elevated soluble IL-2 receptor or NK cell function testing. And some of these require invasive techniques, such as demonstrating hemophagocytosis on a bone marrow biopsy. So without having these esoteric or invasive tests performed, our patient met some of the criteria already. So our patient had fever, splenomegaly, bicytopenia, and elevated serum ferritin. So he was very close to achieving the five out of eight criteria for this diagnosis. So treatment of Secondary, so there's a chance our patient had secondary HLH. Treatment of secondary HLH is entirely dependent on treating the underlying cause. The most common causes of HLH that have been documented in literature are EBV and HIV. However, we recently had performed, investigators from our institution had performed a review of all HLH cases reported from October 2003 to 2014 at our hospital. This included 76 cases reported over a 10-year period, and surprisingly enough, we found that Ehrlichia shaftiensis was found to be the causative agent in five out of 76 of these cases, so 7% of our cases of HLH. Two of these patients had very severe disease with CNS involvement. Here's a breakdown of the different 
patients that had ehrlichiosis and HLH. What I'll point out is that they all had very, very high ferritin results. Based on this, we did an addition, excuse me, an additional look back was performed. And what was found is that there were four additional patients that were identified during that time period that also had very high ferritin results and ehrlichia infection. They likely fit the HLH criteria. They only had four fulfilled at that point, but the additional more invasive testing was incomplete. So what's the bottom line here? Well, what we found in, in this study was that HLH is much more common in our area than we thought. Overall, we had 76 cases over 10 years, and if you put that in context, that's more than one case every two months. That, and that's pretty significant when you think of the fact that this is a very life-threatening illness. Ehrlichia is a relatively common cause of HLH, at least in our location. And if we were to account for those patients who weren't completely tested for HLH, approximately 12% of our HLH cases are secondary to Ehrlichia. So based on that, we have set up some hospital best practice measures. Um, what we've tell, told our physician is, physicians is if they suspect HLH, they should always simultaneously order Ehrlichia testing. So now let's go back to our patient. Our patient had what looked like HLH, however, it was Christmas time. The physician was very doubtful that this patient had Ehrlichia. However, Ehrlichia testing was still ordered. And in fact, what we found is that the patient was positive. This is the PCR readout from this patient. And we found that the patient was positive with a cycle threshold of 23. These results were communicated with the physician. And given that the result was unexpected, um, Ehrlichia over Christmas time is most certainly unexpected, the test results were repeated and once again, they were found to be positive. So how did this resolve? This patient was diagnosed with ehrlichiosis secondary to HLH. The rapid diagnosis allowed us to start, doc or allowed for the physicians to start doxycycline immediately. The patient markedly improved when doxycycline was started. This patient made a complete recovery and all laboratory findings normalized. IL-2 receptor testing was indeed found to eventually be elevated, and so eventually this patient was diagnosed with HLH. Also, on further questioning, the patient revealed that he cleared brush for a job and was an avid hunter. I'll also make a point to mention that here in St. Louis anyway, we had a very mild December, so it's entirely possible that we did have ticks out during that time. So I think so the reason why I bring up this case is I think it really highlights some of the benefits of performing testing in-house. This rapid turnaround time allowed the physician to act promptly on a very unexpected result. Performing the test in-house also gave us the ability to troubleshoot the unexpected result and convince ourselves it was true. We actually were able to perform repeat testing there on site and have it done uh, very quickly. Also, offering the test in-house I would like to think, made it a lot more likely that the physician was willing to order it, uh, knowing that they were going to get a rapid turnaround time and it wasn't something that they were going to have to follow up on a week later. So based on this, I'd make the re general recommendation that laboratories should consider offering, offering in-house testing for important tick pathogens, particularly the tick pathogens that are important in their area. So that brings up the question who should offer what. Uh, so if you look at the distribution of the different tick-borne diseases, you'll notice that there's some very clear epidemiologic differences. Um, and this is going to necessitate very different approaches based on the geography. So basically, you know, one test that I, you may go live with in the New England area may not be the right test for the St. Louis, Missouri area. Also, an important consideration are additional targets to include in these tests in the future. So one of these is Heartland virus. So Heartland virus is a novel virus found to be carried by the Lone Star Tick. As of 2018, there's been a total of 40 cases of Heartland virus reported within the central uh, to southern uh, uh, United States. 
It's not currently notifiable or tested for routinely, though. So this could be a very large underestimation of the actual uh, uh, of the actual incidence of this virus. Um, there's similar laboratory and clinical findings to Ehrlichia. So once again, a lot of cases of Ehrlichia may, uh, if they're being just diagnosed clinically, they may actually be cases of heartland viruses. Um, to date, all cases have been hospitalized. So at least in the cases that have been identified, they've all been in severely ill patients, and there have been deaths reported. Another target to consider is bourbon virus. This is, a bourbon, this is a virus that was first isolated from a patient that expired in Bourbon County. This is a county on the border between Missouri and Kansas. This patient was actually being tested for Heartland virus. However, during plaque reduction assays, an unexpected virus grew that most definitely was not Heartland virus. This was identified as Bourbon virus. Recently, bourbon virus has been shown to be present in a small proportion of amblyomma ticks, less than 1%, though it most certainly is out there. It's far more rare than Heartland virus, though additional cases and fatalities have been described, and it has symptoms and laboratory findings similar to Ehrlichia. So one question you may ask is, do we need to routinely test for these viruses? Um, they're quite bad, but they're quite rare. And also, we don't have defined treatment for these viruses. Um, you know, one thing we might have to ask, though, is are we sure they're rare? We need to keep in mind testing bias. These viruses are only tested for in the most dire of situations. This will make them appear to be both more rare and more severe than they actually are. So we may not have the entire picture regarding these viruses. However, I think we can learn the lesson from Powassan virus. So Powassan virus is a tick-borne flavivirus. This is carried by Exodes scapularis. This is a rare virus, but it can cause a severe neurologic disease in humans. It was first characterized in 1970, and it wasn't until 2001 that it became a notifiable disease. Prior to 2006, only 20 cases were reported in the literature. These were patients that did have severe disease. However, when we started looking for it, we started to find this virus. Enhanced surveillance started in Wisconsin in 2003, and enhanced surveillance started in Minnesota in 2006, and since then, we found many cases in those areas. What, what's marked about Powassan virus is after the enhanced surveillance, not only did we find in, an increase in cases, a lot of these cases were very severe. So only 10% of cases were non-neuroinvasive, whereas 90% had some sort of neurologic sequelae. So based on the increase in Powassan testing, we learned a lot about the virus. We learned it's more common than originally thought, and we also learned that it's an important cause of very severe disease. So with that in mind, we may need to start thinking about testing for these viruses on a more regular basis. One thing that's for sure, though, is that this most definitely is going to become something that we are going to have to address soon. Uh, the habitat of ticks are exp is expanding. What I'm showing you here is the habitat of Ixodes scapularis, and highlighted in red are areas where the tick had not been previously reported but we know the tick to be now. I can show you a similar diagram for anaplasm, or excuse me, for amblyoma as well. So uh, this is something that we are going to have to deal with more as the range for these ticks expands. So looking towards the future, we need to be able to simultaneously detect similar pathogens. There's too much overlap in symptomatology for tick-borne diseases. And really, asking the physician to tell the difference between Ehrlichia and Heartland virus will end up missing cases. We also need to be flexible. One size most certainly does not fit all for tick-borne disease testing. And, you know, to put a finer point on it, New England doesn't need the same assay as Missouri. We have very different ticks, at least for the time being, very different diseases, and it should drive how we test. And then finally, we need to be adaptable. We need to have the ability to add testing for new pathogens, such as Heartland or Bourbon virus.
So just to summarize here, the commonality of different tick-borne diseases is dramatically different across the United States. Common tick-borne diseases in South Central United States includes ehrlichiosis, scularemia, and several non-infectious diseases. Ehrlichiosis can lead to life-threatening complications. This includes HLH, necessitating a rapid diagnostic. Ehrlichia and anaplasma laboratory-developed testing performed on the Diasorin Liaison MDX, at least in our laboratory, is accurate, precise, and sensitive. Testing using the liaison allows for multiplexing for other tick-borne diseases. Currently, testing for Babesia is also offered. Finally, the ability to multiplex, create custom panels, and add testing for new pathogens are, in my mind, essential, essential features of tick-borne disease diagnostics. So with that, I'll thank you uh, for listening to me today, and I'd like to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Neil, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Our first question is, ticks are nature's perfect vehicle for transmitting microbes. Did you encounter or detect any co-infections through your validation? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and you know there is a lot of literature around co-infections, and it, it's certainly something that um, uh, everyone needs to keep in mind with tick-borne disease. During our validation, we did not actually see any co-infections, which uh, I actually I find that quite interesting. Um, I will say though that during our validation, we were testing for Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, and those are carried by two different ticks. So um, it's I guess from that from that degree, it's it's not too surprising that we didn't see co-infections. Um, but you know, I do wonder in the back of my mind if uh, maybe we have any uh, Bourbon virus or Heartland virus in there that we don't know because we didn't test for. Thank you. Do you think these co-infections are more likely to occur if the causative agent of Lyme disease is also present? So, you know, as far as, it, it all it all depends on what you test for. Uh, so if, um, you, as far as Lyme disease goes, uh, that, that, the tick that carries Lyme disease also carries anaplasma, which is easily tested for through molecular techniques, and Babesia, which is also easily tested for. So I think you're seeing a lot of co-infections or a lot of co-detections with those organisms because those are three that we were pretty good at testing for. Um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, co-detections or co-infections with Ehrlichia, um, the, the challenge there is uh, there may be co-infections with things like Heartland and Bourbon. It's just uh, we're not routinely testing for them. Um, so, so, yeah, I do think you're more likely to see it with Lyme disease, um, but I think it, it's more of an artifact of what we actually test for. Thank you. Do you see a specific population being tested within your region? For example, men versus women, children versus adults? Um, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I will say um, uh, our testing is driven by exposure. So patients that are out and about in the woods, um, our physicians don't necessarily rely on the history of tick bite. Um, so, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of young adults being tested. We're seeing a lot of kids. Um, however, we're also seeing a lot of our immunosuppressed patients. And particularly, we're seeing a lot of patients that look, look like they have HLH. Um, they're, they're, uh, we're doing a lot of testing in those populations. And uh, like I said, it, it, it's kind of a wide age range, um, uh, but we, we are pretty good about testing uh, immunosuppressed patients. Um, immunosuppressed and really, really sick patients that we don't have a, a, another diagnosis for. Great, thank you. According to literature, testing for tick-borne infections increased fivefold in the last 10 years, and the number of positive test results increased threefold approximately. Are you observing similar trends for pathogens endemic to your region? 
Um, that's a fantastic question. And interestingly, no. Um, what we're seeing with our Ehrlichia rates, anyway, is, is they remain pretty, they've remained pretty constant for the past four to five years. Um, we're not seeing much of a change there. I can say what we have seen more of is when we've test is we've started testing more for some of the um, some of the other viruses like Bourbon virus and Heartland virus, and um, we're not seeing a ton of it, but we're seeing one or two cases here and there, you know, like maybe once a year. Um, so so we're just starting to see those, um, and and those are kind of emerging. But as far as uh, Ehrlichia goes, we haven't really seen an increase, and. I think it probably has to do with the fact that uh, we're very aware of Ehrlichia in our area. We know it's a problem, and um, uh, we've been testing for it for a long time um, and, and testing uh, uh, pretty often for it. So, um, yeah, maybe that explains why our Ehrlichia rates haven't really gone up. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Babesia microti is the most common transfusion transmitted pathogen in the U.S. Do you think that implementation of universal blood screening for Babesia is the way to go in order to prevent transfusion transmitted babesiosis? Um, that you know, that's a really great question, um, and it's it's a complicated question because uh, when we talk about uh, testing the blood supply, um, we're talking about a very very different situation, and we're actually using different tests too. So we're using serology and molecular testing. Um, now, my, my general take on this is, is uh, kind of similar to, to PCR-based testing alone. Um, one size doesn't fit all. Um, I, I think it makes sense to routinely screen for Babesia in certain areas of the country where Babesia is very common. Um, in those areas, you're going to have a good positive predictive value and you're going to uh, very likely catch a lot of uh, potential transmission events. However, screening, it, screening for it in areas where Babesia is uh, very uncommon, very unlikely, um, could potentially cause more harm than good uh, because, uh, you know, if, if particularly if you're using serology, you may have a very poor positive predictive value and you may be mistakenly kicking people out of the blood donor pool um, who would have otherwise, based on false positives, um, who would have otherwise been able to donate. So, um, I, I, you know, short answer, I think it's appropriate, but I think it needs to be done in a targeted manner. Thank you, Neil. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, no, you know, I think uh, in general, this is a rapidly developing area, and um, I think is, uh, you know, the, the tests that we see on the market today, I think, are going to be very, very different in even one, two, three years from now. Um, and, uh, you know, what what looks like a pathogen today or what we are concerned about today, you know, as, as far as some of these new viruses go, um, we may not care about years from now, or they may be the next big thing. Uh, so, personally, I think this is a very exciting area. And um, I'm, I myself am very interested to see uh, what happens in, uh, uh, in, in this field uh, in the future. Thank you again, Neil, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, DSR Molecular, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.